Hi, I'm Adam, also known as Drummer Who Codes. I'm a professional musician and music teacher working in Tennessee, Georgia, and Alabama. In my spare time, I like to learn coding to make websites and video games. I also like to pass on these skills to other people. Perhaps you played the game Vampire Survivors. Today, I'm going to show you how to create the basic mechanics of your own auto-battler game similar to Vampire Survivors using GDevelop. If you've never heard of GDevelop, it's a no-code game engine that allows you to create nearly any 2D game you can conceive. Since it's a no-code engine, you don't have to know any coding or programming languages to create games with it. That way, you can spend more time designing your game and implementing features and less time writing tedious computer code. The best thing about GDevelop is that it's completely free. Even though you don't have to know how to code to use it, it will help to know a little bit about computer logic, but I'll be sure to get you up to speed as we go along. Now that we have the introductions out of the way, let's get started making our game. The first thing we have to do is create a new game. Open GDevelop. You can use either the web version or the downloadable version. Go to the build section and click on the create a project button. You can choose a project name or leave the default name that GDevelop chooses for you. You can save your project in the cloud or locally on your computer, but for this tutorial, we'll save it to our computer. Finally, we'll set our resolution to 1920 by 1080 and make sure that the optimize for pixel art box is checked. The next thing we're going to do is create a simple map screen to set up our game world. Go to the object panel and click the add a new object button. We're going to create a tiled sprite which is great for creating the ground in a top down game. We'll name it ground and create a placeholder image by clicking the create with pistol button. For now, we'll just use a dark green square. Don't worry, we'll use a more suitable graphic later on, but this will work for now. Save the sprite and click Apply. Now we have a ground object. Drag your new ground object into the scene. The square outline is everything that you'll see on screen with the default camera zoom. Hit the preview button to check out our scene. Hmm, that ground looks a little small. Since we're using the tiled sprite, we can resize it as large as we want and it will automatically create a tiled pattern. We'll see that in action with an actual sprite in part two of this tutorial. For now, let's go ahead and turn on the grid so we can more accurately place our object. Now, when we hit the preview button, the ground takes up the whole screen. Next, let's create a character for your player to control. Click the Add a New Object button, and this time we'll select a regular sprite object. We'll name this one Player. In order to add a graphic, we have to click the Add an Animation button. Let's use Piskel to create another placeholder graphic. You can use any color you like, or even create your own graphic, but I'm going to use a blue square to keep things simple for the moment. Remember, you can always go back and change your graphics later, so we aren't setting anything in stone. Don't forget to save and hit Apply. Drag your player object into the scene and hit Preview. I'm hitting the arrow keys, but my sprite doesn't seem to be responding. That's because it doesn't know how to behave. Luckily, GDevelop comes with a multitude of built-in behaviors that take care of many common tasks. Not only that, but there are many extra behaviors that you can download for free, and more are being added all the time by the GDevelop community. As you learn more about GDevelop, you can even create and share your own behaviors. For this one, we're going to choose the top-down movement behavior. The basic programming logic is already taken care of, but there are several parameters that you can tweak to get the feel that you want for your game. For my game, I'm going to set the acceleration and deceleration values to 10,000, and I'll uncheck the rotate object option so our sprite always faces the same direction. Experiment with these values as much as you like. If you don't like it, you can always change it right back. Now, when we hit preview, and we use the arrow keys, our player moves. Now that our player can move, we need some enemies to fight. You probably know the drill by now. Let's add a new object, select sprite, add an animation, and create your artwork. I'll name this one Enemy and click Apply. Now drag the enemy into your scene and hit Preview. 
It isn't very exciting yet, our enemy just sits there, so let's make him chase our player around the room. For this, we'll have to use a custom event. At the top of your screen, you should see a tab that says Untitled Scene, and then in parentheses, Events. Let's click over to that tab. This is where you can decide what happens in your game. Click Add an Event. For each event, you can add a condition in the Add Condition area, then you can add an action that will occur whenever that condition is met. If you don't add a condition, the event will run every single frame, which is typically about 60 times per second. For this, we're going to have this event run once as soon as the scene begins. Click Add Condition and type Beginning into the search bar. Then select At the Beginning of the Scene. Now click OK. Over on the Add Action side, we're going to select the object that we want to add the action to. We want the enemy to chase our player, so select the enemy object. And we want to add a force that pushes the enemy toward the player. Use the search bar to find Add a Force Toward an Object. This will ensure that our enemy travels toward the player no matter where it is. Under Target Object, select Player, and then put a value in Speed. This is the number of pixels per second that the enemy will move. I'll put 200 for now, but you can use whatever value you like. We can always change it later. Now, click the button that says Permanent to ensure that the force is constantly being applied. Otherwise, it will only be applied one time. Click OK and Preview. Now, our enemy moves toward our player and keeps going right off the screen. That's because the force is being constantly applied to where our player is at the beginning of the scene, which is the condition that we set. In order to make our enemy chase the player, we need to have it change course as the player moves. For this, we're going to use an extension. Extensions are additions to GDevelop's functionality, kind of like the behaviors that we used earlier. Click the Project Manager button at the top left of the window, then click Create or Search for New Extensions. We're going to use an extension called Repeat Every X Seconds. This extension creates a condition in which an action is fired at a regular time interval that we choose. Click the extension, then click Install in Project, and close the search box and the Project Manager. We're going to change the condition from at the beginning of the scene to repeat every X seconds. We have to name the timer, so we'll call it Enemy Path Timer, and we'll set it to 0.1 seconds so it triggers every tenth of a second. Now hit Preview, and our enemy chases the player. But it gets faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. That's because every time the code runs, it adds more force to the enemy, making it go faster every tenth of a second. What we need to do is remove the old force, then apply a new one. Let's click Add Action, then click on the enemy object, then find Stop the Object, and hit OK. Finally, we want to stop the force, then add the new force, not the other way around. So drag the action that we just created above the other action and hit Preview. Now it works as expected. The final thing that we're going to do for now is to have our player attack the enemy. But first, that enemy was moving a little bit too fast, so let's slow his force down to 125 pixels per second. Let's go back to the Scene tab and create a new object. This object will be a sprite, and we'll call it Bullet. Add an animation, and we'll just make this one a circle. Don't forget to hit Apply. To make the bullet work, we're going to download a new behavior called Fire Bullets. Double click on your player object, then go to Behaviors, then Add a Behavior, then Search New Behaviors, then search for Fire Bullets. Click on the behavior and install it in the project. 
and finally add it to the player object. There are lots of parameters to play with, but we'll leave most of them alone for right now. We'll just change the firing cooldown to 0.5, which means that we can only fire a bullet every half second at most. Click Apply, and go back to the Events tab. Click on Add a New Event, but leave the condition blank as we want this one to run every frame. Click Add Action and select Player. We now have loads more actions thanks to the fire bullet behavior that we just added. The only one that we want is fire bullets toward a position. Now we have to tell it where the bullet should begin and what direction it should travel. We want it to begin at our player object, so we tell it to fire from our player object's X position and the player object's Y position. Position is calculated on a Cartesian coordinate plane that you probably learned about back in elementary, middle school, or high school. So the way that we tell it to fire from that position is by typing player.x, that's a capital X, and then an opening and closing parentheses with nothing inside them. And the same thing for the Y value, but with a capital Y instead of a capital X. If you're confused about the parentheses, don't worry about those too much right now. Just know that if you need an object's X or Y position, you just have to put the name of the object, the period, capital X or Y, and the empty parentheses. For the name of the bullet object, we'll select bullet. Then for target, we'll enter the values like we did for the player's position, but with enemy instead of player. For speed of the bullet, we'll put 500. Then click OK and Preview. And everything works as expected, but the bullets don't seem to be affecting our enemy. Let's fix that with another event. For this condition, we'll want it to trigger when the bullet collides with the enemy. So select Bullet, then Collision, and then Enemy. So this code will run whenever the bullet sprite collides with the enemy sprite. Now hit OK. Now for the action, select enemy and choose delete the object, which will remove the object from the game entirely. Click OK and preview. And the enemy now disappears when it gets hit by the bullet. Here are some things for you to try on your own. Try to make the bullet disappear when it hits the enemy. Go back to the Scene tab and drag more enemy objects into the scene and see what happens when you preview. Also, try changing some of the values that we set earlier, such as the force on the enemy object, or maybe the cooldown rate, or some of the other parameters from the fire bullets behavior. I hope you've enjoyed implementing the basics of our automatic battler game. Look out for my next video where we'll be adding functionality such as randomly spawning enemies, a health system, more detailed graphics, and more. And if you want to see me developing a game live in real time, be sure to check out my Twitch channel at twitch.tv slash drummer who codes, separated by underscores, where I go live several times per week developing games for GDevelop and the Godot game engine. Don't forget to like and subscribe and leave me a comment letting me know what you'd like to see me cover next. And I'll see you in the next one.